Well, here we are, uh, four weeks in already to our series on 5G. Not the cell phone service, but five biblical words that start with G that can transform our lives much greater than any uh, cell phone service ever could. And we started by looking at God and how we can see God by looking at Jesus, because Jesus is God. We looked at grow and how the Holy Spirit can help us to grow, to look more and more like Jesus in our attitudes and our actions. We looked at gift, how the Holy Spirit gives each one of us gifts of the Spirit, and then, most of all, the greatest gift of all, the presence of the Holy Spirit within us. And now today, we're on to our fourth G word. One of you had a grandchild who heard about this series and says, I know what the next one is. It's grace. And that's a good guess. But it's actually wrong. In fact, the word that we're going to look at today, nobody would guess. The word is a bigger long shot than the horse that won the Kentucky Derby. <laughs> that biblical word is garrison. How, how many of you uh, uh, even know the word garrison? Okay, a few hands out there. You might recall the story. It only appears in one Bible story. Of course, God and grow and gift, they're all over the scriptures. But Gerasene only shows up in one story. But it's worth looking at that story because of what it tells us about Jesus and about ourselves and about others. It's in both Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So it's in three of the four Gospels, this same story. But we're going to read it today from the Gospel of Luke. It starts off right after Jesus has calmed the storm at sea. Remember that from the first week? And they have now made it across the Sea of Galilee. They've landed on the other shore. And we pick up in chapter 8 of Luke, verse 26. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. So there's that, that G word, the Gerasenes the region of the Gerasenes. Some uh, ancient uh, versions have call it the, the Gadarenes, and others uh, call it the, the Ger Gergesenes, but it's all in the same general area. You know, when you tell people where you're from, it, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're down in Florida and somebody asks where you're from, you say, from Minnesota. If you're out in Minnesota, and they ask where you're from, you might say, well, from the Twin Cities area. And of course, if you're around Dakota County or, or across the river, you say, I'm, I'm from Hastings. So it's sort of the same way here. Um, fortunately, they all start with G, so we can't go wrong here. You can pick whichever one you want. Gerasene, Gadarene, Gergesene, uh, you pick it. It's the same place that we're talking about. But I'm going to use the word Gerasene because that's how it's most frequently remembered. And since we've already taken a little detour here, um, I'm going to, to tell you another story before we dig in to what happens to the Gerasenes. A little over a year ago, a study came out to, in the, the journal Psychological Science, and they found if presented with the moral choice of saving pigs' lives or a person's lives, elementary age children would save the pigs. Now, the study was set up like this. They said, there are two shipwrecks. They're going down. You only have time to save those on one of the ships. And the ship that you don't save, they are all going to die. That's the setup. And then they varied the number of animals on each of the ships. So they would, would tell this uh, child, on one ship, there are 100 pigs. On the other ship, there's one person. Which ship are you going to save? Or they go the other way. There's 100 people on one ship and one pig on the other ship. Which ship are you going to go to and save? And they, they varied all sorts of, of numbers in there. And they found that 
by the time you got to 10 pigs versus one person, the majority of kids would let the person die and save the pigs. And if the animal were a dog, then you were really out of luck. <laughs> because almost none of the kids would save the person, even if it was just one dog and one person, they would save the dog. Which is kind of frightening, especially if you're a parent with children, because those children that you've sacrificed and given your life to, when push comes to shove, will rescue Fido and let you go down with the ship. Now, they did the study with adults as well. And the majority of adults never sacrificed the person. No matter how many pigs or dogs there were on the other ship, they would rescue the human being. At least that's what they said they would do. But what about in real life? Is there a point where we care more for pigs than people? And does it depend on who that other person is? Well, let's go back to the Gerasenes and listen to their story. Jesus has just landed on the beach when he meets one particular Gerasene person. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. You know, the description of the man here sounds almost more like an animal than like a person. He has no clothes. He has no home. He roams the cemetery. And at times the people chain him up like a dog and put him under guard, but he breaks free and he runs away. Cut off from human society, he roams like a feral dog among the tombs. Mark's gospel says that day and night he would scream and cut himself as he wandered the tombs. Have you ever met anybody like this? No, maybe not exactly like that. Maybe they had, the, they had clothes on or maybe they were wandering the streets of town and not out in the cemetery. But have you met someone who, whose life was a living hell? Who was possessed by demons of addiction or or self-harm, or mental illness, or maybe even an actual demon? You ever met anybody whose life was like this man? How did you respond to him? What was your inclination? Was your inclination to ignore them? To run away from them? Or to show compassion? Did you let them sink or swim out on their own among the tombs? Or did you talk to them? As, the follower, as followers of Jesus, let's see how Jesus responds when he encounters this garrison man. Pick it up in verse 30. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. The abyss could also be translated the deep, the depths, the bottomless pit. They begged him not to order them into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. And when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. There's an interesting side note here in the story. The demons beg Jesus not to send them into the deep. But as soon as they're away from Jesus, they wind up in the deep anyways. How many times have, have we not wanted Jesus to be in control of our lives? Felt that 
we'd be better off if, if we just did things our ways, if, if Jesus wasn't, wasn't messing around with us. No, we'd be, we'd be better off on our own, our own demons say to us. Let's run away from Jesus. It'll only hurt us if we followed him. But then we'd go off and we wind up harming ourselves anyways. Before we know it, we're going over the edge and plunging down. But that's another sermon, so we're not going to go there. We're going to get back to the story here. Verse 34. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. It's a miracle. Jesus, in his compassion, has healed this garrison man. He was living like an animal, and now he's fully human. He was hurting himself and acting wild, and now he's clothed and in his right mind. He was treated like an animal, chained and under guard, banished to the tombs, and now he's got a seat beside Jesus. This is the greatest thing that it has ever happened to a garrison. And the most awesome thing that the other garrisons had ever witnessed. So how did they react? How did they did they shout and celebrate? Did they hug and congratulate their healed neighbor? Did they beg Jesus to stay and work miracles in their own lives, casting out the demons in their own lives and setting them free? I wish. No, they actually begged Jesus to leave. Verse 35. Sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and he left. So why are they so afraid of Jesus? because he messes with their lives. They were perfectly fine to have 2,000 pigs. That's the number that the Gospel of Mark reports. 2,000 pigs. They were perfectly fine to have 2,000 pigs and one hurting man rather than one saved man and 2,000 dead pigs. And I'm pretty sure like the little kids in, in that survey, they would have picked it, the pigs even if there's just 10 of them over their one neighbor. Pigs meant money. Pigs meant a living. Do you know how much 2,000 pigs are worth? But what's the worth of one person healed and restored by Jesus? Pigs and prophets meant more to them than their neighbor. They were more afraid of a God who heals than a whole legion of demons as long as the demons afflict someone else. The Gerasenes preferred animals to people and treated people like animals, at least some people. But Jesus met the hurting man with compassion, freed him from his demons, and welcomed him to sit right at his side. So the question is, are we more like the Gerasenes or like our Lord Jesus? How do we respond to our hurting neighbors? I served a little church uh, about 100 miles down the river in the town of Dakota. The church was Riverside United Methodist Church. And a few, for, few miles further down the road from Riverside, there was an old motel that was turned into a vet, veteran's home. And the men in that home in many ways were like the garrison man, living outside of town, many coping with addictions and mental illness. It was not easy to deal with them, and their way of life was kind of scary. I don't know what it looks like today. Uh, couldn't even find a picture online. But at the time, there was a shack, a, a building, a, a shed, called a shed, outside of the rooms where the men could go to smoke, which many of them did. And I remember 
walking in there to talk to them, and it was like stepping into the gates of hell. The air was so thick with smoke that it was blue, and you couldn't make out the faces of the people just on the other side of the shed from you. These men did not have it easy. And often, the, really the only people they saw were, were the staff at the veterans' home. Except for, well, except for the followers of Jesus at Riverside Church. You see, they would visit. They would throw parties. They would have hymns sings. They would do their best to view these veterans as beloved children of God. And every Sunday, they would send a car to pick up any of the men who wanted to come to church and worship with them. And that meant putting up with some pretty powerful smells and odd behavior and uncomfortable moments in that little church. It was not uncommon for my sermon to be interrupted by a question or a comment or something totally unrelated to what I was talking about. Kind of keeps you on your toes as a preacher to have uh, folks that will just shout out in the middle of a, a sermon. Uh, so uh, don't feel that you have to do that. <laughs> it wasn't always easy. It was at times uncomfortable to welcome these veterans to church. But the folks at Riverside never treated these men as less than human. In fact, they loved them as Christ would. And the men thrived. One of the men was so appreciative that he wanted to give back in some way. And the leaders talked about it, and they decided that they would elect him a church trustee. And never has anyone been so thrilled to be asked to serve on a church committee as this man. He felt so honored. He felt so blessed because these Christians saw him as a person and not just one of those weird guys from the veterans' home that we pick up on Sundays. They made a place for him. Now those church folks had a choice. They, they could have chosen their own comfort and convenience and left those, those men sitting by themselves outside of town. Nobody would have have said anything if they never sent a car or if they never went to visit them. And yet they did. They brought them into worship and they gave them a seat right beside them. If it came to pigs or people, the good folks at Riverside Church would have chosen the people every time. Even if those people were dealing with demons like the garrison man. So what about us? What about me and you personally? Where have we chosen pigs over people? Have we placed more value on our finances or our comfortable lives or the status quo than we have on the hurting people around us? And let me get real personal here. Do we treat our animals better than we treat our neighbors? At least some of them. No, I'm not telling you to mistreat your animals. We should love our animals, but how much more so should we love our neighbors created in the very image of God? It cost the, it cost the people of Garrison 2,000 pigs to have one of their neighbors healed. And that was too big a price for them, so they asked Jesus to leave literally begged him to leave. What do we do? What will we do when we encounter a neighbor like the garrison man? Will we beg Jesus to leave? Or will we celebrate the power that he has to heal and to save? Well, the garrison crowd begged Jesus to leave, the garrison man begged to go along with Jesus. Verse 38. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. 
So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Jesus doesn't take the man with him, separating him again from his community. No, he sends him back to his neighbors with a mission. And the mission is to tell people how much God has done for him. How much Jesus has done for him. Remember, Jesus is God. And that's our mission too. To tell how much God has done for us. Maybe you were in a situation like the garrison man or, or some other situation where you struggled, where you felt alone. Maybe even felt possessed by, by destructive powers beyond your control. But then Jesus changed everything. Well, tell your story. Tell how much God has done for you. Or maybe your part in the story is to be like the, the garrison community. Witnesses to what God has done in somebody else's life. Well, even so, go tell the story. Go tell what you've seen and heard. And if you ever have to choose between pigs or people, choose your neighbor. Little kids might not understand that. They might not know better, but you do. Because you are a follower of Jesus. And that's just what he did. He chose people every time. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we thank you that there is nothing going on in our lives that is too big for you. We might be possessed by a whole legion of demons, or we might have just a little trouble. Either way, you care and you can heal you can save, and you can restore us. So thank you, Lord, for your work in, in our own lives and in the lives of our neighbors, our family and friends. And God, for those who have not yet known the power of your touch, of your word, we pray, Lord, that you would, that you would show up on their on their sh seashore. Respond to them in their wilderness and their wandering among the tombs. And free them to live anew. Give them a story to tell of how much you've done for them. Because we're so grateful of what you've done for us. Lord, we want to follow in your footsteps. So give us the courage, the love, the bravery to do so. Amen.